Well, I'm a little sad also that the, everything has to end tonight. Um, it's been wonderful to see Brother Jeff and Sherry again and hear them sing. Uh, we love them and love their music, and I've really, really enjoyed the fellowship with uh, Brother Lamont and uh, an opportunity to be back with you folks again. Um, and I hope I can be a blessing tonight. I really wrestled with what I was going to preach tonight. I didn't bring a bunch of uh, messages already outlined with me for this. Uh, I wasn't sure which way the Lord would want me to go each day, so I've tried to just, you know, listen to the Lord. And, and I had intended yesterday, I was uh, thinking about going into this evening, the, um, since this is about the Bible, and we've kind of been talking about the uh, integrity of the King James Bible, and why it is the book that God spoke to us, um, why it is God's perfect and just weight, um, why it is it's just like the Lord, it's eternal like Him, pure like Him, and just has the same power that He has, and we've been talking about that. And so tonight I was thinking about going into the history of the King James Bible and the history of how it was corrupted down through the years. That's originally... and I thinking about it yesterday and told Brother Lamont that's what I intended to do tonight. Um, and, uh, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I think the Lord wants me to do something else. Um, and uh, because, you know, uh, one is a matter of history, which is good. I love history. It's one of my favorite subjects in school. I love reading history and reading about history. Um, but I, I think since uh, I understand that originally these meetings were scripture conferences and revival. So that's a heart issue. So I thought instead of history tonight, we're just going to stay on the heart. Because when it comes down to it, I could tell you the history of the King James Bible and you might be impressed and you might be in awe that, wow, what an amazing book. We could talk about the history of corruption and you might be fascinated by that. But you know what it really comes down to? I learned this the hard way. It, it's always a heart issue when it comes to what your Bible means to you. It's a heart issue. Uh, I learned that early on when, when I first came to a conviction about the King James Bible. I thought everybody should see it the way I saw it. And I had, uh, I had uh, back then a brother-in-law at the time who went, uh, was a graduate of another Bible college down south. I won't tell you which one it was in Lynchburg, Virginia. But um, anyway, he came out of that school with, um, you know... Obviously, no conviction about the King James Bible. He had something else. I don't know what it was, an NIV or a new ASV or something like that. And so we got together at holidays when all the family was together, and we were with the relatives. One, and he and I had debated this and argued about this for several years. I would advocate and defend the King James Bible, and he would, you know, he, he would be really, really defensive about that and get upset, and he would think I was attacking him and it, it, it was not normally, I was young and it was not normally a pleasant conversation. But one Christmas we were together at my, my mother-in-law's house then and, and he was there with his wife and kids and I was there, my wife and kids and it was a holiday time, it was supposed to be pleasant and we were together in some room up there and I, I don't even remember what I said. He made a comment and I responded and then I made a comment, he responded and I said something about the NIV. He took offense and, uh, and, and it almost came to blows. We were nose to nose and we're almost ready to literally fight over the King James Bible. And then... Better sense prevailed, and you know, and I, I came to my senses, and I, whoa, what are we doing here? Like this is crazy, and I, I said to him, I said, um, I said Mark, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I said I'm really sorry. I said uh, I promise you, I will never bring this subject up again. But I want you to do one thing for me. He said, What's that? I said I have a book I want you to read, and. Uh, you, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It was a book by Gail Ripplinger. I think it was the first book she wrote, New Age Bible Versions. And I had read it. Uh, I think I stayed up all night and read it in one night. And it's not a small book. And it gave me the chills. It gave me the chills. If you've ever seen it. How many have ever seen that book or heard of it or read it? Okay, a few of you. If you haven't, you need to get it. You need to read it. On the cover is a picture of a dragon, which seems like a, a strange thing to put on the cover of a book about the King James Bible. But the premise of the book 
Uh, there have been many books written about the differences between the King James and the other versions. Hers is not a book about that. Hers is a book about the similarities between all those other versions and why they attack the Word of God in the same way, in the same verses, and she sort of looked at it from the standpoint of whose spirit is behind all of that. Because it, although those are different committees that met at different periods of time over a big span of years, they all seem to think and, and, and attack the Scriptures in the same way as if it was coordinated by someone spiritual. As if the devil himself were pulling these strings. And that was the premise of her book. And I'll tell you, it gave me chills when I read it because I was obviously already understood that the devil was behind any kind of a change or an attack on this book. But she, she made it irrefutable that this is not just men just so happen to make the same changes in the same places. There is a spirit involved in that. And uh, so anyway, I said, Mark, I got a book for you to read. And if you'll promise me you'll read that book, I, I promise you I will never, ever say... Any, uh, say a word about this again, and if you decide you're gonna, you don't want that, you, don't, you, 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 you read it and you disagree and throw the book away, I still will promise I, I'll never bring it up again. He said, all right, I'll, I'll promise you that. So I sent him the book. I didn't hear from him for a year. One year passed. It was about Christmas the following year. I got a phone call, and he didn't even say hello. I said, hello, and he goes, all right, I got three questions for you. Mark? Yeah, I got three questions for you. You answer these three questions, and I'll admit you're right. The King James Bible is the Word of God. He'd read that book. And there were three issues, silly little issues. Is it true that King James was gay? Is it true, you know, silly stuff like that. So he wanted those three silly things resolved, and I did on the phone with him. And he, it was quiet. He said, all right, I, I admit, I admit, you're right. And then a funny thing happened. I thought I was a King James Bible defender, this man went on a crusade. He went on a, he lived in Johnstown, Pennsylvania at the time, and he went on a, on a crusade to win every preacher in his town. It didn't even matter if they were saved. He went to Pentecostals, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists. It didn't matter who they were. He put a package together of material about this thick, sent me a copy, I still have it, sent me a copy of all the documentation, he wrote to Cambridge University and got things out of their archives that have never even been published about Westcott and Hort. He got, became personal friends with the librarian, the chief librarian at Cambridge University, and got documents and put this package together. And I said, Mark, I said, man, I said, this is awesome. And he mailed it to every preacher in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And, and then followed it up with a phone call and a visit to make sure that that, that they were going to be, they, surely you read that, and what do you think about the King James Bible? And uh, this went on for about three years. And uh, he grew and grew and grew. And then finally, one day, I get a, com a phone call from him. And he said, Brother Mike, he said, I've changed my mind. I said, what? About what? About the King James Bible. He says, the more I research it and the more I think about it, I don't, I don't think so. He said, I think that the preservation ended with the Greek and the Hebrew and does not continue into the English. So we debated that for a little bit. Do you know what I learned from that? I learned that from the beginning, it's not a matter of manuscript evidence. You can research and research and study the history and you can know Westcott and Hort's social security numbers and know everything about them and understand who did this and who did that and Origen and Eusebius and all these guys and know all of that. But it still comes down to faith. It's, it's really a heart issue all along. It's the heart. And I love history and I love manuscript evidence. I teach it in our Bible Institute. And we could talk about the manuscripts and we could go, we could keep you going for, you know, several years on the manuscript evidence and the history and the, and the biographies of all these guys that were involved. But what I've learned is it still comes down to, you don't need any of that to believe. Just like you don't even need the archaeology to believe that the Bible's true. You don't need science to believe that the Bible's true. You don't need manuscript evidence, although I teach it and it's important. And you don't need the history of all these things. 
to have your heart right toward the Word of God. It shouldn't take those things to persuade you. It's a heart issue. So I thought maybe the Lord just wanted me to park on this heart issue again tonight for, for that reason. So go with me back to where we started on Sunday morning, Revelation chapter 3. And I'm, I don't think I'm going to hit the same verses, perhaps, but I'm certainly a similar subject to what we began with. And uh, Revelation chapter 3, of course, is the... It, here I want you to look at the Philadelphian church, and you remember, I hope you remember, uh, two years ago I preached from this text and uh, didn't emphasize this particular point, but uh, of course, you, you, I hope you understand what those seven churches are in the book of Revelation. They were seven literal congregations that existed during the days of John, but they're also prophetic. They're also a picture of... Uh, of the church age, because men, other men have, have noticed and, and written about how each one of these churches seems very, very similar to the, the, to the periods in Christianity that are very similar to the conditions in these churches, right? I'm sure that's been taught here, and I don't have to go through that again with you. Like the church of Ephesus, it, the things that God says about the church of Ephesus are very similar to the conditions in Christianity at the beginning of the church age. And the things that God says about the church of Laodicea, the last one, are the conditions of Christianity in these last days. So you can sort of follow it along. Some guys have even put dates on, and those dates are up for discussion, I guess. But uh, there's generally a pretty, you get a pretty good idea. If you read through those seven churches, you kind of are looking at church history from the time of Christ until the present day, right? So if you back up to the, the last church, of course, is Laodicea, but if you back up to the church of Philadelphia, it would put you back uh, 100 years or so or 150 years or so back into the time of uh, the Reformation up until maybe the middle 1800s or perhaps until the time of Westcott and Hort. If you had to put a date on it, and I don't want to do that or care to do that, but you would put it somewhere around the, 15, the church of Philadelphia from around the 1500s uh, to probably the time of Westcott and Hort, because that's the time of the Reformation. That's the time, obviously, when the, the Word of God came out of the Greek and the Hebrew and all these other things and came into the English language and eventually was purified into its present form in the King James Bible, God's perfect and just weight, God's purified Word, God's eternal Word, God's standard for the world, for mankind, and for every other translation. This is what God weighs everything by, the King James Bible. And that took place during that Philadelphian church age. We've always said in our church, and uh, I, it's not new with me, it's, it came from my pastor, and he always used to say that he hoped and wanted our church to always be a Philadelphian church in a Laodicean age. So even though the spirit around us is the spirit of that Laodicean church, the description of a church that seems to have no need, right? They, they, they said no need of anything, no, no need of anything. But really, in the eyes of God, are spiritually bankrupt, sick, lukewarm. Uh, 98.6 is lukewarm, fleshly. Uh, all about the eyes, right? That's why they need eyes to have, right? Because it's how it looks, right? It's the appearance of things. And it's got to look a certain way. And it's all about flash. And it's all about... Whatever. But anyway, but the church of Philadelphia is what we ought to be, and Philadelphian Christians is what we ought to aspire to be. And what was it that caused the Lord to speak about this church in such a tremendous way? There's no negative thing that He says about this church. He only commends them. And uh, so that would be wonderful. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord looked on First Baptist Church and had nothing negative to say? Or your church? or your life, and he'd look at you and he could say, well done. Nothing negative, no criticism. There's no criticism here of the Church of Philadelphia. But how do we explain that? What's the root of it? How, how, do, you, how do you, I want a church like that. How do you get that? How do you accomplish that? All kinds of books and seminars on how to build a church. It's all garbage. It's all garbage. God tells you here how to get a church like that and how to have a life like that or a family like that where the Lord could look at that and be pleased. That is the main purpose of your life anyway, right? You were created for His pleasure, right? Your main reason for existing is just to bring God pleasure. 
And when you stop bringing God pleasure, you have no more reason for existing. You don't even have a reason to be here if your life isn't bringing in pleasure. And our church doesn't have a reason to exist if it isn't pleasing Him. And, uh, but what is it about that church that just so pleased the Lord? Well, he said it was two things. He says down there in verse number 8, he says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And the time of the Reformation was the time of that open door, the time of the biggest missionary endeavors of all history. Um, and, uh, and the time when the Word of God went around the world and left an impact on nations everywhere in that generation. And it says, and no man can shut it. And here it is. For thou hast a little strength. And the body of Christ was very small in that time. Roman Catholicism dominated the world. You know, false religions dominated the world. But real true believers were just in small pockets here and there during the Reformation. They were not the majority. We really never have been. We've always just been a little flock. You know, the Lord speaks of us as the little flock. And, and only have a little strength, right? We only have a little strength of our own. And uh, the rest is just God doing it. And so he says, Thou hast a little strength, and here it is, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now those are the two things, I think, that stand out. And since this is a scripture conference, then obviously we're going to just focus on that one, the, one of the two, which is, Thou hast kept, thou hast kept, my word, kept my word. That's what I want to talk about again today. Even though I know we've talked about it already, we've brought it up. But I want to just park on that thought for this evening and pray that the Holy Spirit will just get a hold of every one of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, help me tonight to be a blessing to this church. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified. You have magnified your word above all your name. And I pray that tonight we could understand a little bit better what you mean by keeping it. Lord, uh, not what we think, the, think it means, but Lord, show us what you've said about it. Show us what you mean by that. Help us to understand what it means for a child of God to keep your word. And help us to realize, Lord, that that is the right way, the right path to hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It isn't how many tracts we've passed out or how many we had in church. It isn't whether anybody even knew our name or not. Lord, it all comes down to that heart attitude and that heart relationship with your word. And I pray that tonight that could be impressed upon every one of our hearts again. I pray for this dear church. I thank you for Brother Robert and Bethany and their family, the music we've heard tonight, the fellowship we've enjoyed. And I pray for this church, Lord. I pray that you would knit these dear people together in love. Lord, what a blessing it is. Lord, what a blessing it is when brethren just dwell together in unity. And I pray that you'd help this church to have that, Lord. And help us tonight, Lord, just to, that our hearts and minds might be quieted so that we could hear. Lord, so many times there's so much going on in our brains that, Lord, we, there's so much noise in our own thoughts that it's hard to hear what you would say to us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak loud and clear tonight to the hearts of your people and help me, Lord. Without you, this is just going to be wasted time. So please help tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. All right. So I always love this. I, I mean, I'm a, I told you I love words. English was my favorite. I love history, but English was by far my favorite subject. And I love words. And, um, only, well, my Bible is just filled with words. <laughs> that, uh, I have an art background, but there's no pictures in here, <laughs> you know. And I think about all the travels that Paul, Paul went through in his missionary travels through some of the most beautiful parts of this world. I mean, trace his travels on a map and you'll see he went through some of the most gorgeous scenery in the world and the Lord didn't even care enough about us to give us any pictures of it in here. Yeah. The only thing he retained are the words. <laughs> so there's going to be enough scenery for us to enjoy in heaven. In the meantime, it's just words. But these words are spirit and life. These words are the most important thing that you and I have. I mean that with all my heart. The words of this book are the most important thing and should be the most important thing in your life. If it were not for these words, you wouldn't know anything about salvation. You wouldn't have been warned about hell were it not for words. Words from God's mouth. 
You wouldn't know your Savior or anything about Him or how to please Him if it were not for words that came out of God's mouth that God cared enough about to, to preserve until you could get a hold of them. Words, they're the most important thing that we have. So we should be pretty particular about words, and especially these words, right? So, uh, this is just me, so I love thinking and counting how many times something appears in the Bible. Like, how many times does the word keep or kept or keepeth? Well, 583 times, thank you very much. Um, 583 times God talks about keeping things. And so if you want to know what God means about something, you can check, well, you, sometimes Webster gets it right, but a lot of times Webster doesn't get it right. So the Bible, the King James Bible, defines its own terms, always. If you look long enough, you'll see somewhere in the Scriptures God will give you a definition of every word. Even the difficult words are defined. The King James Bible has a built-in dictionary. You don't have to scratch your head and wonder why. I just can't understand that book. You would if you read it, because in there, God would give you definitions of every word. And so I'm always interested in what does God mean about these words? What does God, what does God how, how does He use that word? Well, I want to know because it looks like this church received the commendation of God for doing two things, keeping His word and not denying His name. So what does it mean? What did they do? Uh, what did God mean by keeping it? Well, out of those 583 times, I hope you know this, that you always look for the first and the last because the first mention of anything in the Scriptures is normally where the definition is established. And if not, at least some important thing about that subject or that word is usually going to be there for you to learn from. And you, you'll find that, again, it's a consistent pattern. It's so consistent, it's even called a law, the law of first mention. And so using that law, that principle, just look for the first time any form of this word shows up in your Bible. And it's early. It's in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. So let's go to the very beginning and see right at the start how God uses this word, what He means by it. And it gives us a little clue. And we'll look at a few more. But here at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 15, it might not seem so, you know, significant, but it's something that we can learn about this word keep or kept. Uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. All right? So, there's the first mention. So I'm going to learn something about keeping. What does it mean in this case? Well, what was, what was Adam supposed to do with the garden of Eden? He was just supposed to take care of it. He was supposed, he didn't have to protect it. You know, there were no, you know, God could do that. But in other words, it was <clears throat> given to him as a responsibility and he was to care for it. He was to take good care with this that had been given to him. Right? He had a responsibility. And so now he's supposed to dress it and keep it. Right? And there's the first mention and it gives us a little idea as to how God uses that word and what he means by it. Well, the second time it shows up in the Bible is in chapter 3 and uh, verse number 24. Chapter 3 and verse number 24. You know, what happens after sin came into the garden, God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden. And in verse number 24, he said, He drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. There's the second time that keep shows up. And it's similar. It's similar. Um, in this case, what was this angel with this flaming sword doing with the way, the path, the road, whatever, to the tree of life? He was, he was keeping guard. He was protecting the tree of life. Why would the tree of life need to be protected? Because remember, it had the power to give a person eternal life. And God didn't want Adam living forever in a sinful, fallen condition. So now God has to keep this sinner away from the thing that could have made him last forever in that condition. It has to be, he, that angel has to keep the way, protect the way, guard the way. So there you see keep is, you know, still kind of similar. Taking care of something, guarding something, protecting something in a sense. All right? These are the first two times that the word... Now, I know many other times in the Scriptures it has the idea of obeying, um, 
uh, following, keeping the commandments, keeping so on and so forth. But the majority of times in the scriptures, it does not mean to obey. It means to hold on to, to protect. Uh, let me show you a couple of verses that actually have that built-in dictionary there. Go to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 4. I'll show you the King James Bible's ability to define its own terms. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 4. <clears throat> and the Bible does so by giving you synonyms right in the same verse. You know what a synonym is? It's uh, two words that mean the same. Two different words that uh, have the same meaning, a synonym. And in Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse number 4. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Do you see the Bible defining its own terms? What does it mean to keep the commandments? Retain them in your heart. Right? That's what it means to keep. Retain. Don't let it go. Right? The Bible's defining its terms. Keep it in your heart. Retain these words. Hold on to them. Don't let them slip away, right? We forget things easily, right? We forget. How do you hold on to something? Well, you meditate on it. You think it over. You write it down. You look at it again a few times. And you, you hide it, you know. You, that's what it means to keep, to retain, to hide, to guard, to protect, to take care of, right? This is God's definition of it. Look at another one. Uh, while we're in Proverbs, just go to Proverbs chapter 7 and verse number 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. That's what it means. Lay it up. That's what people do with keepsakes, right? They lay them up somewhere safe. Put them away. Keep, it's, it's valuable to them. They don't want to lose it. Don't want anybody to break it. Don't want anybody to take it. So it's going to be laid up. It's going to be stored up. That's what God, it's almost like the same like retained. You see what you're supposed to be doing with these words? That's very different from carrying them under your arm back and forth to church. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, is about as far as some Christians get with the King James Bible. They open it when it's, getting, when it's being preached, but they don't retain it. They don't lay it up. They don't protect it. They don't guard it. They let it slip away. Now, the Church of Philadelphia did not do that. They kept those words. And God could say to them, in effect, well done. Not a word of criticism. And there's plenty of us, you know, and plenty in our lives worthy of criticism. But, you know, it's almost as if when the Lord sees that, that one heart issue concerning his word, there's a whole lot of things he overlooks. He did it in the life of David. That's the key of David. How do you explain a man like David, so human like you and I, with blood on his hands, a man who let lust in his life almost ruin him, and then he committed murder to cover it up, and then he lied about it. He's got... He's, it's not a great track record there. And yet, God was merciful to him. And God, those sure mercies of David. How do you explain that? It's only the key of David is that Psalm 119, his heart toward the word of God. And of course, God knows what your heart is toward his word. He knows whether you care much about it or not, whether you love it, whether you read it, whether you want to hold it in your heart, whether you understand its value whether you really love it like David did, we spoke the other day on the love the, of loving the Word of God. David said it again and again and again and again. He delighted in the Word of God. He loved the Word of God. Oh, how love I thy law, he said. So, keeping it in your heart. Hey, another verse, a famous verse where the definition is right there, obviously, in the verse is Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver uh, purified in a furnace of earth, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's showing you those two words are the same. Synonyms. Keep, preserve. Keep, retain. Keep, lay up. Keep, guard. Keep, protect. Is that what you're doing with the words of God? You know, that's where... Real victory in the Christian life starts. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It all starts right there. It starts by Christians hanging on to them, Christians holding on to them. You know what? God's not asking you to do anything that He hasn't done 
Aren't you glad that God keeps what you commit unto Him? That's what Paul said. I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. I committed my soul to Jesus Christ. He's able to keep it and has already professed that He will keep it. What has He committed to me? His words. I commit something eternal to Him. He said, I'll keep that. I'll never lose that. He said concerning His disciples, Father, John chapter 17, I have kept them that Thou hast given me and none of them are lost. <laughs> he keeps. He doesn't let go of it. And then He commits something eternal to us and He says, keep that. Would you hold on to that? Would you treat that as precious to you as I treat you? <laughs> I treat you as something precious to me and have promised I'll never let you go. I will keep you until you see me face to face. And the only thing the Lord of any eternal value, the only eternal thing He's ever committed to you are His words. The only thing He asked you and I to do was hang on to them. Hold on to those. Don't let them go. Treat them with as much love and honor. Count them as, as precious to you, God could say, as you are to me. God keeps what we commit to Him. The Bible says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We're kept by the power of God. And He asks you and I, keep, keep my words. Well, where am I supposed to keep them? Well, you know where they're meant to be kept, right? It, they're meant to be kept in the only place that they actually work. Right? You can have a bag of seed. I, have, I am not a farmer. I know there are former farmers and maybe guys in here that are farmers still. I don't know a thing about farming. I grew up in a, in a town and now I live in a city. So I, I don't know anything about that sort of stuff. And I know a lot of the Bible, God uses agricultural analogies to help us understand things. I got to go look that stuff up because I don't know anything about it. But I do know this because my wife loves to garden. And I do know that you can put seed in a bag, put it in the garage, and come back 10 years from now and you still have a bag of seed. It really doesn't do anything in the bag, right? It's there. It's got, every, it's got the potential, all that DNA, you know, that's going to make beautiful plants and have fruit and all this stuff. It's all in there. And, but as long as it's in the bag, it's completely, well, I don't want to say worthless, but that is not where God intended it to stay. There's the verse about, is the seed yet in the barn? <laughs> Why would God ask that? Because in the barn, it doesn't do any good. It was meant to go in the earth, Right? The Bible likens in the parable of the sower and the seed, the seed being planted in the earth. That's the heart. That's the human heart. So the seed, the word in your Bible, and it could be a King James Bible, is absolutely worthless. Can I tell you that? This book, this precious King James Bible, is absolutely worthless until it gets in somebody's heart. That's why it has to be preached so it goes through the ear hopefully gets in the heart because it's in the heart in the earth where the seed works it germinates and it brings forth life and so it's if this is seed then it only does good when it gets in you and it doesn't get in you by osmosis you know you might put it under your pillow at night and get, get a good night's rest but it isn't doing you any good it isn't doing you any good until it's in you. In you. Say, well, I listen to the preaching all the time. And most of the time it goes in one ear and right out the other. All right. You heard the joke about the farmer who saw a fly, fly in the cow's mouth. And then a few minutes later he looked in the bucket of milk and he saw a fly in the milk. He goes, look at that. In one ear and out the udder. <laughs> but 
unfortunately, that's the way many people treat the Word of God. It's just in one ear, and then it's forgotten, it's gone. Either the devil snatched it away, or we're just so busy, we have so many more important things that we're thinking about. we got a lot to do. We're busy people. We're important people. And stuff has to get done, and it won't get done unless I do it. And so we're all mostly more, much more Martha than we are Mary, and because um, there's a lot to get done. But the most important part of our life, the most important part of our day, the most important part of our ministry is really getting this inside here. Because without getting this in here, I'm really not much used to God. I might get some stuff done, but in the end it's going to burn up at the judgment seat of Christ. And so it doesn't bring any glory to Him because it was done in my own ability, my own energy, my own strength. And it wasn't done as a result, as a fruit of the Word of God in our hearts. And that's the only time the Lord is getting pleasure out of our lives and getting glory out of our accomplishments is when it's the result of His Word in our hearts because we learn from that, we gain wisdom from that, we get understanding from that, and then we go in the strength of that. Right? Otherwise, um, I don't know what it's worth. Otherwise, I think it's just Laodicean. I think it's just Laodicean and not Philadelphian. And unfortunately, a lot of ministries are carried on and, the, and, and they may be beautiful to look at. There might be a lot of eye candy there. Uh, very impressive to see it. But if you could see the heart of it, and if you could see what men are motivated by, you'd see it was, not, it was not a love for the Word of God. Let me go show you something here, if we could. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. <clears throat> this is one of those passages that has always stood out for me. It's always been a precious part of the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 22. And let's go down there to verse number 17. Now, there, there are 15 sermons in these few verses right here, and I always have to reel myself in and not try to preach them while I'm going through this because there's just really one thing I want to pull out of this. But verse 17 Bow down thine ear, and hear the words of the wise. All right? uh, I like that because it's telling you basically what to do with the Scriptures and the attitude by which you need to approach the Word of God. Bow down thine ear. So there's humility there, in a sense, right? Bow down thine ear. A lot of guys approach the Scriptures as, you know, theologians. Preachers, pastors, I, I just come as a hungry beggar. You know. Lord, I, I need something. I just, I need something. I don't care what I think I might know. I just want God to speak and God to teach me. And show me something out of His Word. And when you think you know something, the Lord is really quick to humble you. And so it's just good to start out humble, bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise, and then apply, apply thine heart unto my knowledge. Apply thine heart. I, I've always thought that it's a strange way of the wording is a little odd there. Apply thine heart unto my knowledge. We think of applying the Word of God to our lives. But it's actually the other way around. We're supposed to apply our lives. You know when you apply something, you, like you apply paint. The paint conforms to the wall. The wall doesn't conform to the paint. Right? The paint just sticks and conforms itself. You've applied it to the wall. And it takes the form of the wall. God says, apply thine heart. Just, <laughs> just adapt, change, conform yourself to this. Right? Not figure out how this could fit into your life. Because Christians say, well, that doesn't really fit with what I think, or that doesn't really fit with my lifestyle. I know, preacher, that's in the Bible, but you know what? That verse is really not, you know, that really, that's not really for me. That's not for my circumstances. Really? That's interesting. But you're not supposed to apply this book to your life. You're supposed to apply this book apply your life 
to this book and can be conformed. To be conformed, not to the world, but to be conformed to the Word of God. Change whatever needs to be changed so that your life fits what's spoken here. Right? That's what it means to apply thine heart unto my knowledge. David said, I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. That's what you need to do. You've got to stick. Just stick to the book. And let God conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. Because when you look in here, you're going to see the image of Jesus Christ. And what's God trying to do? Conform you to the image of His Son. Well, what does that mean? Some photograph that He has up in heaven and He's trying to, going to shape your nose? Or, no, the image of Jesus Christ is this. It's here. And the Lord's trying to conform you to the image of His Son. So you, that doesn't happen unless you apply your heart, the real center of your person, all the real eternal issues of your life, you're willing to just be exposed by the Word of God and change whatever needs to be changed in your attitude and in your thoughts and in your ways, how you think about yourself, how you think about others, and just allow you to be conformed to what you see in here. And the only way that can happen is if you spend enough time in here. Not searching theologically for something to help you win an argument or best the preacher, you know. Preacher's so dumb. I know the Bible so much better than he does. You know, if he only was as smart as me, if he only studied his Bible like I do, and I, I just consider it my calling in life to help the preacher out so he understands his Bible a lot better. Every church has those guys in it. Every single church does. And I can smell them. It's 40 years in the ministry. I can smell them. And it's okay. It doesn't rattle me. But there are guys that just feel it's their calling in life to educate the preacher. To help him understand his Bible better. You know how you can do that? You can get on your knees with a little bit of humility and pray for him. That's what you can do. You can pray for him. And you can encourage him. Yeah, all right, that could be a rabbit trail, but I am going to resist. Okay, all right, let's go back to Proverbs 22. Apply thine heart unto my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them under your arm, on the coffee table, on the dashboard. No, where are you supposed to keep these things? In, within thee. It's a pleasant thing if you keep them within thee. It's really, it is pleasant. It's a wonderful thing to have the Word of God in your heart. And then when you're in a circumstance, the Holy Spirit of God just whispers that verse or brings that truth back to your remembrance. And it's like, oh, yeah. And then you know what to do. You know how to respond, right? It's, it's pleasant. And then notice what happens. If you keep them within you, they will with all, means with all means likewise at the same time, be fitted in thy lips. Be fitted in thy lips. In other words, I mean, I, I said the other day, I'm, I'm blessed with a bunch of young men that love the Word of God in our church, and they love memorizing the Scriptures. They preach on the street a lot. I go with them whenever I can, but they go without me, which is great. And uh, every week, we, two or three days a week, we have guys just on their own. They don't need any coaxing from me. They go to the train stations, the bus stations. They go to, on the Staten Island Ferry. They preach on the ferry. They go on street corners, and they just preach. And uh, I love it. I, I personally love that ministry. And, and they love it and don't need me to help them do it. They do it without me. But they love to memorize Scripture. And sometimes I have to remind them that uh, it's, not how, much, it's how many, not how many verses you know by heart. It's how many of those verses are really in your heart. It's how many of those verses have really changed you on the inside. That's what matters. Because if you hide them within thee, if you keep them within you, then with all, with all of that, they will be fitted in your lips. It, it'll, it'll come out at the right time in the right way. We don't have to like machine gun somebody with all the verses that we know. But da 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 wow. Like to see you come back from that. <laughs> well, no, sometimes it's just better to just be quiet. A word fitly spoken, the Bible says. 
and it says fitted in your lips, right? So when it's fitly spoken, it means suitable, suitable, fit, right? It means suitable. And so that word fitly spoken is fitted in your lips, but that's the result of having hid it in our hearts. I would not want to put anybody on the spot, but I'd wonder how much of God's word do you have hidden in your heart? How much of it, really? Let's be honest. How much of it do we have in our hearts? I know, I know brothers that can rattle off baseball scores of some guy that batted in, in like 1957 and his statistics and he was a pitcher and this and that. I don't even, they lose me. I, my, my eyes just glaze over after the first 30 seconds. I have no idea what they're talking about. And I marvel at how much they know. You get some guys and they can tell you, well, this engine of that car in 1957, it was this and it was that. And they could tell you anything and everything about an engine or about fish or about the stars or about this. And ask them for a couple of Bible verses and they like, John 3.16, John 3.16, for God so loved. You know, and we wonder why in the world are our churches such a mess? Why in the world are Christians in so much trouble these days? Why is everybody having such a hard time staying happy and, and, and having a little kindness and charity toward one another? Why is everybody so upset with one another? Well, most of it is because we don't have enough of that book in our heart. You put enough of that book in your heart, you'll be a better husband. You put enough of that book in your heart, you will, be, you will learn how to be a wife. You'll learn how to be parents. You'll learn how to serve the Lord. You'll learn how to be a pastor. Uh, my, I'm grateful because my pastor, Mel Sabaka, years ago, had a heart for young men, took me under his wing, as he did a lot of other guys. And, um, and I can't really say that he sat me down and said, well, son, the ministry, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and this, and this, and, and then after this. He never told me what to do. He never, it was so frustrating because when you went to him for counsel and said, what do you think I ought to do about this? He'd say, I don't know. Why don't you read your Bible and pray about it? Well, well, no, I was hoping you... Uh, you wanted me to be the Holy Spirit, huh? <laughs> you didn't want to go... Because <laughs> that's the slow, hard way. Go read and get on your knees. And it was frustrating. And I, but I learned a lesson from him. People come to me and say, Pastor, what do you think I ought to do about... I don't know. I don't want to be the one to tell you. But I can tell you this. I know where you can find the answer. I tell you, you, you go open that book and you get on your knees and you seek God for an answer and He will show you. He will never let you down. If you pray. And, um, but, but Pastor uh, Sabaka used to say uh, uh, he wanted us to, when it came to what we were supposed to do, how we're supposed to live, he never established like what we were supposed to wear. There were no like things that you had to agree to live by or dress code or anything like that. It's not that they were, our church is liberal or have no standards. But he put this first. He said, I want you to fall in love with Jesus Christ in that book. Amen. You fall in love with Jesus Christ, you won't need me to tell you where to go and where not to go, what to wear and what not to wear. Fall in love with Jesus Christ in that book, and you'll understand what you need to do. Now, he preached hard, but I'm grateful for those lessons because it always came back to the book. It always came back to the, uh, 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 my relationship with the Word of God. And I, get, I guarantee you, whatever struggles you're having, personal struggles, spiritual struggles, whatever they might be, uh, you can probably trace them back to a relationship, a right relationship, or the lack of a right relationship with the Word of God. It never fails. I, that's pretty consistent in, in my experience uh, all these years in the ministry. <clears throat> um, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Where does it work? In you. In you. It's not until you put the seed in the ground. It's not until you put in the book in your heart. That's where it works. It does its work inside of us. Right? And so if you don't feel that reading and meditating and studying and memorizing the Word of God is important in your life, then you will never 
see victory as a Christian, ever. And I'm, I'm saying that as a guy that struggles with that as well. I'm, I'm not some superior form of Christianity up here. I'm, I'm a stinking low down rat most of the time myself. And every struggle and every heartache I have in life is often the result of just not being in God's word as I should be. Not soaking this up. Not wallowing in it, you know. Not considering it in the right way. Not, not treating it in the right way. Daniel, you don't have to turn there, but in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel had uh, revealed to him an, the, the interpretation of a really scary dream, a really scary truth. The Bible says Daniel kept this matter in his heart, kept it in his heart. Mary, the Lord's mother, when she was given the announcement that she was going to give birth to the, to the Messiah, the Bible says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Even the disciples, when they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and they saw the Lord transformed right before them, the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, verse 36, that the disciples kept it close and told no man. Kept it close. What does that mean? Kept it close. Hmm. That means like, you know, I hate to make a secular analogy, but somebody playing cards, you know, you kind of you keep your cards close. You know, and they kept it close. They kept it in their heart. They, they kept it secret. The Lord didn't want them telling it just yet. He told them in another, one of the other books, in Matthew it says, he told them to just not to say anything until after his resurrection. And they kept it in their heart, what he meant by after his resurrection. So rather than discuss it, even among themselves, they just kept that, those instructions in their heart. But that's what God wants you to do with his words. Keep them in your heart. Keep them in your Side. That's where they will do the most good. Keeping them in your heart leads to obedience out of a right motive. Keeping them in your heart. You know that you can obey without having a right heart attitude? My kids could do that when they were little. I could tell them to do something and they would do it but I could see the look on their face. They're grumbling on the inside. It's not really, they're not listening to me and doing what I said out of love for me. They just don't want to get a spanking. <laughs> well, that's the wrong motive. If you're saved, now that might be the right motive to get saved because you don't want to go to hell, but I tell you what, that's not the motive God wants you to live by. Our obedience ought to be motivated by love. It ought to be an obedience I want to do what he said because I love the one who said it. <laughs> that's what we hope for in our children. That's what we hope for in our children. I, and that's what God hopes for. I hope my, God must say, I hope my children will just do what I say because they love the one that said those things. But of course, you'll never get that unless you get those words in your heart and you esteem them highly and you, and, and you begin to love them as you, as you ought to. Um, Keeping God's word shows that you value it properly. You treasure it. We keep what we treasure. We treat very poorly things that we really don't see the value in. Right? What we, what we really value, we normally take care of it. Right? That's human nature. If it's important to us, we take care of it. We guard it. We protect that. You can see the difference in somebody that's given something and somebody that had to pay for it and buy it themselves. Right? Well, we were talking about buying our kids cars. Brother Lamone and I were about you could buy your children a car and they'll treat that differently than if they had bought it themselves. <laughs> it, it's, in, it's always true. If they invested it in themselves or at least have to pay the insurance on it or something, if they've got money in that, they're going to treat it very, very differently than if it cost them nothing. Because now they value it. This cost me something. And the Word of God, if it's a treasure to you, if it's, a if it's a, of any value to you, then you will do what the Lord asks you to do, and that is keep it in your heart. Go with me to another passage in Proverbs while we're there. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. Uh, my son, it says in verse 1, if thou wilt receive my words. Now he's going to tell you how to receive them, what to do with The attitude to have, if God has spoken words to you and he expects you to receive them and hide them. Look at that. There it is again. 
So go to verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart, there it is again, to understanding. Apply your heart to his word, to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures. He, what is he talking about here? The word of God. Hid treasure. God says, that's what my book is. That's what my words are. Hidden treasure. So it's not the truth the wisdom that you can gain from this, the understanding of your, in your heart that God wants you to have isn't something that comes just by superficially glancing through the Word of God, your verse for the day or your proverb for the day. You're going to have to park here a little while and go down deep. You're going to have to dig the ground up a little bit like somebody looking for treasure. You're going to, that's what he says. This is not even a stretch. Am I stretching this? This is what God said. This, God said, I want you to treat my words just exactly like this. I want you to cry for understanding and knowledge. I want you to dig. I want you to... Why, Lord, are you making it so difficult? Why shouldn't this Christian life, this, why shouldn't wisdom and understanding and knowledge be simpler than that? He wants to see, wants to know how important it is to you. How important is it to you? How long and, and what effort would you put into actually going down in here into this book and finding out what God has to say? I'm sure there must be. I can't imagine it would be true, but I'm sure there are preachers in the world that don't study for messages because you can get them offline. You can take notes from Bible conferences. You can listen to preaching and write the outline down and then just preach it. You don't have to dig at all. I've, I, I've actually heard preaching where somebody told somebody else, else's illustration as if it had happened to them and just changed the name and the event couldn't have happened to both those preachers. But they told it as if it did, as if it happened to them. I heard a guy preach one time and I said to myself, I know I've heard this somewhere before. I not, somewhere. I went on the Internet. I found his outline, all of his illustrations. The entire message was there word for word. Even the introduction. It was all right there. I knew a man, and, and he has since gotten things right. And I love this brother, and he, he's very dear to me. But there was a time, and he acknowledges this is true, there was a time in his life, in his ministry, when he'd study for about 30 minutes before time to preach on a Sunday morning. That's, that's it. That was about the only time he opened his Bible. And his wife confirmed that that was true. He was in the ministry for 20 years. And she said, you know, I seldom ever saw him open his Bible, but 30 minutes before the service, he'd go looking through there for something to say. And then mostly what he preached was just stories and personal anecdotes and, you know, just a lot of stuff. But it's a shame because... If, if the preachers don't exhibit a love for the Word of God, most likely folks in the pew aren't, aren't going to have that either. But folks, it, it has to be this way because God has commanded it. Now watch the benefit of this. It says, verse 4, If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then, this is one of those if-then statements, like right? if this and this and this, then this. If you have this kind of an attitude, this sort of a heart, this kind of a desire where it's important enough to you that you'd actually get up maybe a little earlier than you normally do or, or make a little time in your schedule. Someone, I won't say who, but in this church told me, I wish I had more time to read my Bible. I don't really read my Bible because I, I really just don't have time. I wouldn't want to embarrass them. But folks, that, that should never be our excuse to God. That's going to be really difficult to say that to the Lord when you stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. Lord, I, I really wanted to read your word more, but I was so busy. Folks, it's going to be a shame to have to say those words. You probably won't even have to say it. It'll be said for you because the Bible says uh, the book is going to give a report on you. <laughs> Ooh, that's scary. But anyway, 
By the way, oh, turn with me for a second. Speaking of hid treasure, go back with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's a very interesting and instructive thing. But there are seven churches in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and there also happen to be seven parables of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13. Seven parables, seven churches. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or lined them up, but the seven parables of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 13 line up with each one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The church of Ephesus, the church of the apostolic period in the very beginning of Christianity, matches up with the parable of the sower and the seed. Right? And um, the church of Laodicea, the seventh church, matches up with the seventh parable, which happens to be a big dragnet that's thrown into the sea and just pulls up stuff good and bad, all mixed mixture. That's the problem in the Laodicean church, just a mixture. A mixture of all kinds of stuff, and then the outcome, you mix hot water with cold water, guess what you get? Mm -hmm. So it's a mixture. The parables all match up with the churches. Well, the sixth church is the church of Philadelphia, and the sixth parable is this one in Matthew chapter 13, verse 45 and 46. It's the parable of the pearl of great price. And a man found a pearl, one pearl it says, one pearl of great price in the earth. And in order to have that pearl, he bought everything. He took all of his money and paid the price to have that one pearl. That's the church of Philadelphia. In other words, in that period, there was one thing that was so important to people, they would spend their lives. They laid their lives down for it. People went to the stake and were burned alive for that book. One thing, one book. In Jesus Christ, when, when Mary sat at his feet, he said, one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away. One thing is needful. One pearl of great price that was so important to somebody, a treasure in the earth. A treasure in the earth like Proverbs chapter 2. The word of God like treasure in the earth that you would cry after, you would dig to get it, you would search you would, you would consider it to be so important that it, you would actually spend some time, spend, spend some money maybe, pay a price to have it. I tell you this, you know what? If you do that, if you live that book and love that book, you will pay a price. It will cost you something. It will. And, but many times we're not willing to pay that price. To really read it, live it, Keep it, because it's costly. It will cost you something. Hey, you might get in here and start to read, and it might cost you the surrender of your whole life to the Lord for His service. It might cost you going in your pocket or your bank account and just giving something to the work of the Lord. The Lord is always looking for, the, for this to cost you. He said, take up your cross and follow. That's, a, that's costly. That's costly. That's personal. So that pearl of great price, that sixth parable, matches up with that sixth church. And so when, it's, when, it, when this book becomes a treasure to us, when we take care to keep it, no matter what it may cost us, when we love it like that and live it like we should, then it, it, will, it will cost us something. So keeping it shows that you treasure it. Keeping it also shows that you love the Lord. In fact, that is the one thing that he looks at to determine whether or not you love him. Say, so, do you love the Lord? Well, amen. amen. And I, if, 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 if you ask me that question, I would, my reflex reaction would be, yes, I love the Lord. But the real truth is, God sees my heart, and he judges how much I love him by how much, by my attitude toward his word. That's, what the, that's not Mike Beach's opinion. That's what the scriptures say. That's how he measures your affection for him. That's how he measures whether or not you really love the Lord. It doesn't matter that you come to church on a regular basis. It doesn't matter that you give your tithe. And you don't cause the preacher any trouble or that you win souls or that whatever. You may be a missionary. You may be a pastor. You may be a street preacher. You may be a Bible scholar. None of that means that you love the Lord. Because there have been people that do all of those things and don't love the Lord. They don't do it out of love. 
When the Lord looks at my life and your life, He determines whether I love Him or not by how I keep His words. Look, for example, at John chapter 14. Let's go there. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Go down to verse number 21. <clears throat> We're almost done. So cheer up. Some of you are afraid you're not going to see the sunrise. <clears throat> I promise I'll have you home before then. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Let's go down to verse number 21. <clears throat> he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Oh, man. Do you own a copy of his word? Yes, you do. You're here with it in your hands. But it says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. That's pretty, that's kind of scary. Because if I value these, treasure them, hide them in my heart, lay them up, that's what keep means, right? Lay them up, retain them, that's what it means. Keep them within thee, that's what it means. That's, that, that's what the Lord's looking at. That's how he judges whether or not I love him or not. It says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And then verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my command. He will keep my words. And my father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Oh, boy. Huh. He that loveth me not, I guess that's one way you can tell whether somebody loves the Lord or not. It, I, I, if I take Jesus Christ at his words, I can say you don't love the Lord if you don't have these words in your heart. Or if you're not even trying to get these words into your heart. Because I didn't say that, he said it. So I can say it on the authority of his words right here. His, he spoke these things. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine. He says, I'm not making this up right now on the spot, my, but the Father's which sent me. In other words, this is a word from God the Father himself, and Jesus Christ said, I'm supposed to say this. You love me, you're going to keep my words. You don't love me, you won't keep my words. Go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2. Near the back of your Bible, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Are you mad at me yet? <laughs> verse, uh, 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. <laughs> Hereby know we that we are in him. <laughs> Right? Somebody in him is going to love his word. You keep it in your heart, the love of God is being perfected in you, right? Perfected in you. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, after you and I are raptured, this world is going to go through that time of the tribulation. A time that the Bible describes as being pretty horrible. The wrath of God is poured out on the earth. Judgments, plagues, famine, war. A lot of supernatural things happening. Creatures coming up out of the earth. Angels preaching the everlasting gospel from the sky. Uh, uh, Moses and Elijah uh, uh, preaching again in Jerusalem. 144,000 witnesses on the earth. A lot of a lot of crazy stuff going on during that tribulation time. And there will be, God's focus in that time is going to be upon the Jewish people, right? For this church age, his focus and his, 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 has been upon the, the Gentile, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, which for the most part is, a Gent, is Gentile. There are some Jews here and there that get saved, but not too many. But they have to get saved the way a Gentile gets saved, right? So... It's a, it's a Gentile kind of salvation. We have several Jews in our church. One is an Israeli, and, I, and, and we always, he went with me to Israel in January and uh, hadn't been back to Israel since 1980. His, his grandfather was a, a rabbi. We had an opportunity to witness to his elderly parents in, uh, in Tel Aviv and give them the gospel. Uh, both of them were Holocaust survivors, but this guy, Eli, is, he's a blessing. Boy, he's a soul winner. 
And I always kid him. I said, uh, well, you're not a Jew anymore, you know. You, you had to get saved the Gentile way. <laughs> you know, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, right? So it doesn't even matter. But God's attention for the moment is upon the world, and the nation of Israel has been set aside in a sense. But after the rapture, God's attention goes back to the, the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people, and He's going to save them. doesn't mean that He's going to neglect all the Gentiles, but notice what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 concerning the rest of the world for the most part here. We could just jump in in verse number 8. Um, because after the rapture it says, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish." Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. What's the real issue? They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. It never was important enough to them. They're not going to hell. Be, they're not damned here because they were drunkards or drug addicts or whoremongers or idolaters, that's not what's sending them to hell. Because I've known some drunkards that got saved. I've known some whoremongers that are now in the ministry who the Lord cleaned up, saved, washed them clean and changed their lives. So nobody goes to hell because that's what they were. They go to hell because nowhere along the way before they died did they ever receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Well, who would ever give them the love of the truth? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is constantly out there trying to woo the sinner to Jesus Christ. Right? Trying to help somebody see that they are lost, that they're condemned, that Jesus Christ loved them, that he died for them. And sooner or later, for a person to get saved, they have to come to the place where, wow, I believe that. I, and in a sense, they, they receive it because they love it. They, they love the fact and accept the fact that that is true. And they don't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. It says, but, it says, um, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Remember Amos chapter 8 verse 11 where God said he was going to send a famine? God is the source of that. I've never heard that point preached when, people have, when preachers have brought up that verse. That that famine, we can't blame that on Thomas Nelson or, or anybody, we, or the devil. We gotta, who's, who's responsible for that? God is sending that famine in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. Because the word of God is no longer important or precious to his people. And so you don't love it, you lose it. And here, this delusion is coming from God himself, not the devil. Because when God sees the attitude of a society, the attitude of a nation, the attitude of a world in this case that despises his word and they won't receive the love of the truth, then they can't be saved. And it goes on to say here, verse number 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. See, they, they needed to receive the love of the truth in verse 10 so that they could believe the truth in verse 12. There's some kind of a connection there. The Lord said, if you love me, those words are going to be important to you. There's, there's the love and the belief there that, that go hand in hand. All right, well, last, last point here. Last point. If you keep his words, the Lord will keep you. Can I prove that? Yeah, go back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm not talking about keeping you saved, because you can't lose your salvation. <clears throat> and you could get saved today and throw the Bible away and despise the Word of God and still go to heaven. Because once you've been born of the Spirit of God, you can't lose that. You're sealed until the day of redemption. So this isn't talking about keeping your salvation. But watch this, Revelation chapter 3. Let's go back to the Church of Philadelphia. And this is, and by the way, the word kept this is the last time in your Bible that it appears. There's one more use of the word keep, which we're going to close the message with, but the word kept is found for the last time concerning the church of Philadelphia. The first time it shows up in the Bible, keep, kept, keepeth, whatever, remember, 
in the garden, Genesis 2.15, keeping the garden. The last time kept shows up is right here, keeping the word of God. So there's some sort of a comparison there. So it says in verse number 8, it says, For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Go down to verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Amen. That's not talking about keeping you saved. But you know what? God does keep us from things. Amen. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee, right? So how do you keep your mind stayed on Jesus Christ? Just get in this book. Meditate on this. Keep these words. Keep your thoughts right there. And what does God do in return? I'll keep that person in perfect peace whose mind stays on me, is stayed upon me. He keeps his thoughts upon the word of God. So the Lord, you keep his word, the Lord will keep you. He'll keep you in perfect peace. He'll not only keep you in perfect peace, He will keep you in the center of His will. It's so easy for us to stray out of the will of God. Amen? Christians all the time are saying, Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. Please bless me. Well, God must be saying, well, get on blessing ground. Get somewhere where I can bless you. God wants to bless. That's His heart to bless. And rather than saying, oh, God, bless me, oh, God, bless me, how about just get in that place that God will bless you in? And God will, God will pour his blessings out if you're in the right location. <laughs> hey, it, 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 if there's a, a nice stream, a nice waterfall of clean, cold water coming down right here, and I'm standing over here and dying of thirst, saying, oh, man, I'm thirsty, I wish I had some cold water. I would. Well, then just get over here where the water's pouring down, silly. Oh, bless me, God. Oh, God, bless me. Oh, God, bless me. We'll get over there where God can bless you. Look at this verse right here. Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 7. Last verse, and this is the last verse of the message, and the last time in your Bible that the word keep shows up. Revelation chapter 22, look at verse number 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. All right? Blessings come because you keep the sayings of this book. Keep them in your heart. Keep them in your life. Keep them close. Keep it close to you. All right? Retain it. Lay it up. Hide it. Love it. Dig for it like treasure. And what happens? The blessings come. The blessings come. Peace comes. Right? Answers to prayer come. Right? We don't have time to go through all the things that result from keeping the Word of God, but I'm sure by now you get the drift. We don't have to keep going with this. But I guess my, my only question here at the end of this meeting now and at the end of this conference is, what are you really doing with the Word of God in your, in your life? What are you doing with it? If you love it, you know, you're going to care to see other people get it too. You're going to care. The idea that there are countries in this world that don't have one verse of Scripture. That would matter to you when you realize its value, its worth. Right? When it becomes precious to you and you're grateful for what it's done in your life, then it might break your heart to think about there are a lot of people out there that have never heard one verse yet. And there are countries that have never seen a Bible. And you're not likely to be able to get those Bibles to very many people, but you know what? You can support ministries that do if you love the Scriptures. You'll be more concerned about telling it to your neighbor, about handing it out when you have an opportunity. You say, I don't have time to just talk to everybody. Well, give them a track. Let the, talk, let the track do the talking. Surely you have the time for 30 seconds to do that when you can. But uh, what are you doing? What are you doing with the Word of God? What are you doing with the Word of God? I hope the answer to that question is not embarrassing for you. All right, let's bow our heads.